on World News Tonight. Increasing casualties. Countless civilian lives are taken by the continuing conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Citizens tend to the helpless as ceasefire talks move forward. Russia retreats. Ukrainians have their guard up, but their weapons are down as Russian troops have been retreating from conflicting areas, giving the front line a glimmer of hope. Major slip up. President Biden is not backing down on his words against President Putin. However, the US government is keen on cleaning up the diplomatic misunderstandings. And a blooming spring. The season of spring is welcomed in Japan with spectacular displays of cherry blossoms adorning scenic streets. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. Our top story today still leads with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. While peace talks continue at an unfortunately slow rate, the civilians are those paying the price for the delays. Countless numbers of innocent deaths have been reported following what Ukrainians call attacks targeted at the helpless. Residents in the city of Kharkiv cleared debris at a children's school that was hit by a Russian missile over the weekend. The latest sign said a former student that Russian forces were targeting even the most innocent of civilians. In the besieged city of Mariupol, the mayor's office said nearly 5,000 people, including about 210 children, had been killed there alone during the month-long conflict with another 160,000 still trapped in the heavily bombarded city without power and with few supplies. Reuters could not independently verify those figures. <laughs> Meanwhile, a Russian delegation arrived in Turkey on Monday, the site of the first face-to-face -face peace talks in more than two weeks between Russia and Ukraine. Ukrainian officials downplayed the chances of a major breakthrough, and a senior U.S. official also said that Russian President Vladimir Putin did not appear ready to make compromises to end the war. And the Wall Street Journal reported on Monday that Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich, who at the request of Ukraine had helped negotiate for peace back on March 3rd, along with Ukrainian negotiators at the meeting, suffered symptoms of suspected poisoning. The journal reported that Abramovich and the Ukrainian negotiators have since improved and their lives aren't in danger, adding that some blamed hardliners in Moscow for the attack, though one Ukrainian negotiator called the story, quote, speculation. The West has imposed heavy sanctions on billionaires such as Abramovich, who was forced to put his Chelsea soccer club up for sale. It seems there may be a liver of hope left in affected citizens at Mykolaiv, a key city of the road to Odessa, is seeing retreating Russian forces after some terrible weeks in which the Russian army has uh, tried in vain to blow up this strategic city. The threat in the last few days seemed to be have eased a bit. It was not long ago this road was controlled by Russian forces, but recently troops have been pulling back from the strategic southern city Mykolaiv. For its civilians, the retreat means they can dare to hope. The Ukrainian flag flying once again here in Bashtanka, a town that was seized by the Russian army. Bashtanka is just a few kilometers from Mykolaiv city center. In this field, remnants of Russia's presence. This truck used to shoot rockets was destroyed by Ukrainians who defended their town. Following weeks of intense fighting with Russian forces, Ukrainian troops are seeing some gains on the ground. Bashtanka has seen heavy shelling. Civilians have been left in shock. Still, there's some relief now that troops are no longer present. The threat has gone for now in Mykolaiv, where there is a hope for calm, following days of intense targeted bombing since the start of Russia's invasion. For Moscow, Mykolaiv is a stepping stone to the key seaport of Odessa. But so far, the city has been able to withstand the Russian offensive. And as war wages on, it seems Russian realtors are avoiding putting their commercial hopes into one basket. New reporters have found that wealthy Russians are investing in real estate abroad in countries such as the UAE in hopes of monetary sustenance. Wealthy Russians have poured money into real estate in the United Arab Emirates and Turkey. That's according to some property firms in the region. It comes as Western sanctions hit Russia hard over the conflict in Ukraine. Tiago Kaldas is CEO of Dubai firm Modern Living. 
He's hired three Russian-speaking agents due to higher demand. The Russians are already used to Dubai. They just kept coming more. Yeah, obviously the, the number of Russians who get interested in the market here now is much more than I would say two months ago or three months ago. Both Turkey and the UAE have criticized Russia's invasion, but they still have good ties with Moscow. They also both still operate direct flights, offering a route out for Russians with their money. Kaldas says wealthy buyers seemed to be making preparations and moving their money out of Russia even before the war began. Buying property in Turkey can also be a way to get a passport from the country, while in the UAE it can be a way to earn a residency visa. Right in the beginning of the invasion of Ukraine, we launched a campaign uh, in the region. And the number of, of uh, people that contacted us, it was, I would say, at least 10 times higher than it usually would be for such type of, uh, of campaign. In February, Russians bought 509 houses in Turkey, almost double the number of last year, according to the country's statistics office. Real estate agents expect the number to grow further both there and in the UAE. And while Russian oligarchs are clouded in controversial financial decisions, President Biden is also engulfed in a controversial of his own making, following scathing remarks in Europe, which many believe was the United States pressing for a regime change in Russia. After sparking a global controversy, U.S. President Joe Biden on Monday defended his recent remark that Russian President Vladimir Putin cannot remain in power. Do you believe what you said, that Putin can't remain in power? I wasn't then, nor am I now, articulating a policy change. I was expressing the moral outrage that I feel, and I make no apologies for it. Biden noted he had visited with families displaced by Russia's invasion of Ukraine just prior to his comment, which came at the end of a speech in the Polish capital. For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Biden's unscripted line forced administration officials to scramble to clarify that the White House was not advocating for regime change in Russia. At the White House Monday, Biden added that he was not walking anything back by clarifying the remark. But just to be clear, are you confident that Vladimir Putin sees it that way, that he will not use this as an escalatory? Uh... I don't care what he thinks. Look, here's the thing. He's going to do what he's going to do. The event was meant to showcase Biden's new $5.79 trillion budget plan that calls for record peacetime military spending while raising taxes for billionaires and lowering government deficits. The plan would reduce the federal deficit by more than $1.3 trillion this year, with another trillion in further reductions planned over the next decade, while imposing a minimum 20 percent federal income tax on the wealthiest Americans, those worth over $100 million. For most Americans, the last few years were very hard, stretching them to the breaking point. But billionaires and large corporations got richer than ever. But U.S. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell was already pushing back, saying Biden's budget was unacceptably light on defense spending at a time of heightened international tensions. In other diplomatic ventures, the U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the top diplomats of Israel and four Arab states held a landmark meeting to discuss issues from the Iran nuclear negotiations to the global shockwaves of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Emphasizing a united front against Tehran's nuclear ambitions in the run-up to an unprecedented summit, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and his Israeli counterpart Yair Lapid acknowledged differences over negotiations with Iran as world powers edge closer to a nuclear deal. Honest dialogue is part of the strength of our friendship. Israel and the United States will continue to work together to prevent a nuclear Iran. While the US wants a return to the 2015 deal that the Trump administration pulled out of, Israel says reactivating it is not enough to curb Iran's nuclear threat. Blinken's looking to reassure Arab states and Israel that the U.S. is committed to their security in the region, amid concerns Washington's paying less attention to the Middle East as relations with China and Russia take priority. The 2020 Abraham Accords saw the UAE, Bahrain and Morocco normalize diplomatic ties with Israel in an agreement brokered by the Trump administration. Held in Israel's Negev desert and bringing together these three states as well as Egypt. This summit is the moment to see what concrete results can begin to emerge from the agreement. Blinken said he hopes to attract other countries in the region to join them, 
this as peacemaking with the Palestinians remains stalled. Normalization is becoming the new normal in this region. And it's enabling our efforts to advance a positive agenda that will actually benefit the lives of our people. Investing in infrastructure, developing renewable energy. And across these efforts, uh, we'll look to, to build on growing normalization, to bring others in, while also forging tangible improvements in the lives of Palestinians. The development of new energy ties is another major point, as countries dependent on Russian gas start to look to Gulf states for their supplies. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. We move on to the updates of the COVID pandemic around the globe. China's dynamic COVID approach is now being actively practiced in Shanghai. Following an unprecedented rise in COVID infections numbers, the lockdown is now causing citizens to scramble for supplies. Shanghai entered a two-stage lockdown Monday as the financial hub of 26 million people scrambles to contain surging COVID-19 cases. The snap lockdown, which was announced on Sunday, will split the city in two, roughly along the Huangpu River for nine days, to allow for staggered testing. It's the biggest COVID-related disruption to hit the city. While residents east of the Huangpu were confined to their homes, those in the west stockpiled groceries and other essential goods as they prepared for a similar fate starting on April 1st. The lockdown order marks a turnaround for Shanghai's authorities, which as late as Saturday denied the city would be locked down. Shanghai's Public Security Bureau said it was closing cross river bridges and tunnels and highway toll booths concentrated in the city's east until Friday. And people leaving the city would have to show a negative test taken within the previous 48 hours. Shanghai also ordered the suspension of work at firms and factories, exempting those offering public services or supplying food. Some hospitals also suspended services as they release staff and other resources to assist with mass testing. Shanghai said earlier this month that its daily testing capacity was around 3 million, but some doctors warned it still might not be enough to outpace the rapid spread of the virus. It has been revealed that major funds intended for financial relief efforts during the pandemic have been maliciously exploited and diverted. Hundreds of billions of dollars are now in the process of being reclaimed from those committing fraud within American systems. This $3.5 million Florida mansion seized by the IRS was bought with taxpayer dollars that were supposed to rescue American jobs and small businesses. Instead, according to law enforcement, it funded a swim-up bar and a horse stable. The buyer got $7 million from the federal government, allegedly claiming he had 400 employees. According to prosecutors, he had none. Michael Horowitz is the top cop overseeing the effort to make sure the five trillion in taxpayer dollars went to the right place. When the Small Business Administration, in sending that money out, basically said to people, apply and sign and tell us that you're really entitled to the money. And of course, for fraudsters, that's an invitation. The fraudsters are bold, buying luxury cars, flights on private jets, mansions like this Los Angeles couple who led a massive $20 million fraud ring using fake IDs to apply for loans for fake businesses. They texted about the cash that was available. You need to apply 10K guaranteed. They don't check for blank. It's all automated. Days later texting, they got the money. I did seven applications last night and four of them got email that it's funded. I'm telling you to apply to Bluevine, an online loan processor. How much they send you? Like over 500 so far. Raising questions as to how they got the money in the first place, Congress now investigating Bluevine, one of the third party service providers who processed billions in loans and touted that a business could get loan approval in five minutes. What didn't happen was even minimal checks to make sure that the money was getting to the right people at the right time. Authorities have pointed to red flags like the couple listing identical payroll every month. We wanted to ask the company why that didn't tip them off. 
Blue Vine would not do an interview, but sent us a statement saying in part, they used robust compliance to reduce fraud in accordance with government guidelines, but say it's regrettable that the government's loan programs were abused by bad actors, despite our best efforts. When federal agents arrived at the couple's door, they allegedly tried to stash this bag of $450,000 in their backyard. Once convicted, they fled, abandoning their teenage children, arrested finally in Montenegro. Investigators insist there are so many more cases like this to uncover. One of their data scientists in California programs computers to find discrepancies. It's basically impossible for humans to go through it by hand. It would take way too much time. Just one red flag, this building in San Francisco that they found listed on more than 1,300 different loan applications. We have our data scientists pouring through those records, looking for anomalies, matching addressing. And what we're here to tell them is we're looking. The countless allegations against former President, U.S. President Donald Trump are now bearing some weight as the American court has found reasons to believe that he has committed felonies in regard to the election debacle and the deadly Capitol riots. A U.S. judge ruled that former President Donald Trump more likely than not committed a felony by trying to pressure his vice president to obstruct Congress and overturn his election defeat on January 6, 2021. That stunning assertion was in a ruling Monday that found the House of Representatives committee probing the deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol has a right to see emails written to Trump by one of his then lawyers, John Eastman. U.S. District Judge David Carter in Los Angeles said that Trump's plan to overturn his November 2020 election defeat to Democrat Joe Biden amounted to a coup, adding, quote, the illegality of the plan was obvious. Representatives of Trump and Eastman did not return requests for comment. Judge Carter's findings marked a breakthrough for the Democratic-led January 6th Select Committee, which earlier this month said it believed Trump might have committed multiple felonies. The panel is expected to make a formal request to the Justice Department that it consider charging Trump. The Capitol riot occurred as then-Vice President Mike Pence and members of both chambers of Congress were meeting to certify Biden as the election winner. We will never give up. We will never concede. Before a mob of thousands stormed the Capitol, Trump gave a fiery speech in which he falsely claimed his election defeat was the result of widespread fraud, an assertion rejected by multiple courts, state election officials, and members of his own administration. In his ruling, Judge Carter put it bluntly, writing, quote, Dr. Eastman and President Trump launched a campaign to overturn a democratic election, an action unprecedented in American history. President Moon Jae-in and President-elect Yoon Suk-yeol met at the Blue House for the first time since the March 9th presidential election in South Korea. They discussed a wide range of issues, including Yoon's plan to relocate the presidential office, financial aid to tackle COVID-19 and national security, amongst other issues of mutual interest. During their first meeting since the election, President Moon Jae-in reportedly showed a willingness to cooperate with President-elect Yoon song yeol on the budget required to relocate the presidential office. This, according to Yoon's chief of staff, Chang Jae-won, who said there were no detailed discussions such as funding, but the topic came up. The president-elect has been pushing to move the presidential office to a building currently used by the defense ministry, but the Blue House had initially raised security concerns. President Moon said the decision on relocating the office falls on the next government, and the current government will closely examine the related budget and work with them on it. Chang said the two agreed on the need for another COVID-19 related supplementary budget, but there was no detailed discussions about when and how much. He added the two sides will continue discussions at the working level. The president-elect wants to draw up an additional supplementary budget worth over 40 billion U.S. dollars to compensate small businesses for losses caused by the pandemic. Chang added the two also discussed security issues and agreed to make sure there are no leaks during the transition of power. This follows North Korea's test launch last Thursday of an intercontinental ballistic missile. There was reportedly no mention of politically sensitive issues, including a potential pardon for imprisoned former President Im Yong-bak 
for specific personnel appointments. President Moon also congratulated the president-elect, wishing him a success, and Yoon thanked the president for the invitation. Along with their chiefs of staff, they met for nearly three hours from around 6 p.m. Korea time on Monday evening, having the longest ever talks between a president and the president-elect in South Korea. However, it took 19 days since the election for them to finally meet, with reports suggesting previous delays were due to politically sensitive issues. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Thousands of supporters of Pakistan's opposition party staged a rally in the capital Islamabad in a show of power against Prime Minister Imran Khan, who faces a no-confidence motion for ouster. Peruvian President Pedro Castillo survived an impeachment vote in Congress that fell short of the votes needed to oust the leftist leader eight months after he took office. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro was taken to hospital for tests after feeling abdominal discomfort. Kenya held the Linus Rally, an all-female rally event aimed at challenging stereotypes over women's participation in motorsports. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed to watch any of the stories we air tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight with views of thousands gathered in central Tokyo to enjoy the view of cherry blossoms blooming for the beginning of the spring. Thank you for watching us again. Have a good night.